Okay, um, so Mark has a question. Uh, I have so many questions about Satan. If he was made through fire, will it bother him being put in the lake of fire? Why is he called God of this world or even a prince? Does God love him? Well, does God love him? Uh, you know, I'm sure that God probably loves him in the same way that every father loves their son, even though when their son has done terrible things, right? There was a, a certain amount of hope, expectation of what the son could be. But there's probably also immense sorrow in God's heart uh, for for Satan. Uh, and we, we catch a glimpse of this in Ezekiel chapter 28. So let's go there to Ezekiel 28. And I think you'll uh, you'll get some insights as to what uh, what happened with Satan. So Ezekiel 28. So we're going to start at verse 12. And here in verse 12, we see Son of Man take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. All right, so the first thing that we're, we're looking at is that this does not sound like a human king. Uh, I don't know of any human king that was ever full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Um, I don't know of anybody that was actually in Eden, the Garden of God, or who had all these different stones as their covering. And were they created? No. We were born. We we're not created. Only Adam was created, and that was directly by God's hand. Uh, the rest of us were born into this world. And then he goes on. He says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Again, doesn't sound like a human. It sounds like uh, some other being. So this, we understand this to be referring to Satan, uh, the anointed cherub who covers. So he had some kind of special role in heaven. Uh, whatever the covering means, we're not entirely sure. But it's something pretty cool. <laughs> right? And he says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. What is the holy mountain of God? The holy mountain of God is the new Jerusalem. How do we know that? Well, again, we go to scripture and we get to see, uh, speaking of this holy mountain, this is in the book of Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. Remember, Mount is just a short word for mountain. So the mountain of Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. So Mount Zion, the city of the living God, New Jerusalem, these are all one and the same thing. These are all the same place. They're all the same thing. Uh, when we go back to Psalm chapter 46, we see this uh, very nice perspective. Um, it says, uh, there is a, a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. So we just read about city of God in Hebrews 12, 22. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. So there, the city of God is Jerusalem. It's none other than Jerusalem. We also see in Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So the sides of the north, that's a really important passage. Let's cruise over here to Isaiah 14. So speaking of, uh, in the English, Lucifer, in the Hebrew, Halel, not Halel. Some people say Halel, that's incorrect, it's Halel. All right, just so you know, hear the difference. Probably coming from the Sumerian Enlil. Uh, that's another story. So, O Lucifer, or Helel, son of the morning, Ben Shahar, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount, or the mountain of the congregation. Where? On the farthest sides of the north. So, we saw that same reference in farthest sides of the north in psalm 48 so the mountain of god is in fact the new jerusalem so in this passage what does he want to do he wants to ascend he wants to exalt his throne above 
the stars of God, probably a reference to angels, I would guess. He wants to sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. But we're told that's where God is sitting. So he wants to supplant God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Wow. But nothing doing. It's not going to happen. Thanks for playing. All right, so we go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. And this is the one who was on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. All right, so part of your question was, you know, what's up with, you know, when he's thrown into the fire, is that going to be such a big deal if he's part of fire? Again, it's a great question. Let's consider this aspect of your question. Walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So who would these fiery stones be, presumably? Well, they would be the cherubim. Ezekiel sees this incredible vision. He, say, he sees uh, this whirlwind coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness all around. There's fire, fire, lots of fire, okay? And also from within the likeness, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, they had four faces, etc. okay? So they are these uh, man-like creatures with four different faces, very odd-looking things. But uh, what else can we learn about these particular creatures? In verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. So they've got fire. They've got lots of fire and even more fire that's coming out of them. So we go back to Ezekiel 28. So you walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. The fiery stones is probably a reference to uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 with the uh, the four uh, kruvim, right? So those were called kruvim, these living creatures. They were cherubim. Satan was a cherub. Uh, so he's of their kind, apparently. And it, we're told that he walked back and forth in their midst. Whatever they were doing, he was doing as well. It says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Uh, now, the next phrase I would suggest it could, is better translated by the abundance of your slandering. Uh, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. So again, what did he do? I don't think that he was just trading. The word here is rachal, rechul uh, which is the same root as slander. Uh, and so again, I, I won't go into all of that, but that's not really your question. But that he was, he was, you know, he was slandering. He was slandering God, and then he became filled with violence within, and he sinned. Right. So it was one thing that it started in his heart, and then it went from his heart uh, to he became filled with violence, and then he sinned. And only after he did those things did God cast him as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Where? Out of the new Jerusalem, where Satan said he, he wanted to ascend above the heights of the clouds and set up his throne above the heights, uh, above the stars of God. That's the place. It's the new Jerusalem that he was kicked out of. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. So his inclusion in that club of of cherubim or kruvim he lost that and notice what else happens it says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor so satan is he was the greatest the most beautiful the wisest but he was so incredible he was overtaken with his with his self he was overtaken by his beauty he really thought he was the real deal and nobody could compare and quite frankly nobody could compare but he missed the point if you really want to be like god it's not what you look like on the outside didn't god say that to samuel when samuel is looking for the next king of israel and he goes to jesse's house and the first son comes out and he's like well my goodness this guy must surely be the king right the next king and god says don't look on the outside appearance i don't look on the outside appearance I look at the heart. And so eventually, David 
you know, the littlest, the runt, gets to be the king. Because God's not looking on the outside. So all of the external trappings that God gave to Satan were things that he did not earn, didn't deserve. He got to enjoy them, but he misused them. And so he became filled with violence, and he started to slander. And so he says, um, I cast you to the ground. And then he goes on again. He says, by the iniquity of your slandering or whatever. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst, and it devoured you. So uh, in the Hebrew, it's I literally, I took the fire out from within you. I took the fire out from within you. So there was fire in Satan's members. God removed that. And so now it would, it would seem that Satan is not able to exist in God's fiery presence. There's something that he is not able to do. Now, again, I cannot tell you all of the mechanics of that because I've never been to that side. But from what I'm reading, something happened. There was fire. Satan had fire, and then he lost the fire. He lost it. Um, and so whatever that means, we don't know exactly. But at the end of all things, it will not be a picnic to be in God's fire. That will be uh, a real shocker. Well, let's put it that way. And uh, so uh, I hope that answers your questions uh, about that. Uh, he will not enjoy his final destiny. It will be not a nice thing. So, If you want to go ahead and uh, contribute to the Patreon uh, on my YouTube channel, I would greatly appreciate that. helps to keep the uh, Douglas Hemp Ministries going. Uh, you can also contribute to the Way Congregation. If you tune in and you watch, consider becoming a monthly supporter, whether on Patreon or we have an app called Tithely at thewaycongregation.com. You can give through that as well.